The tide has shifted, and a dark age of collective creedal superstitions has fallen upon the body of Christ. For hundreds of years, the disfigured noxious discombobulations of the Reformed have polluted the churches. Of course, it isn't limited to them, but a whirlwind of theological disorientation has arisen through the arrogance of the so-called scholarly among us who, via their confessions, creeds, catchphrases, and ignorance, belittle, silence, and intimidate anyone who dare oppose their ideas. Entire structures of power center around these documents and systems that contain as much mythology as truth, and the unrelenting zeal that these people exhibit for their doctrines, in spite of its obvious flaws, is truly cult-like. Mockery, and scoffing a commonplace among the forked tongues of the reformed. I identify their forked tongues due to their often play on confessing God's word, scripture, as primary in all instances, while they inevitably set their preferred text upon the heights of infallibility in place of it. Time and time again, I have witnessed this myself, the reformed of whom I once counted myself among, when confronted and intellectually cornered, will reduce themselves to the primitive snarls and behavior of some of the most deranged and irrational one could ever lay their eyes upon. One such example, of which I had the displeasure of being involved within, saw a pastor of a reformed church attempt to suggest that my critiques of his theology and behavior were unloving, and so he refused to speak with me further, despite his glaring sin and opposition to scripture. Not only this too, but when attempting to move further up the chain of command, so to speak, with evidence provided of the glaring wrongdoing and malpractice of this shepherd, rather than navigating toward true justice, these enablers, like a crew of bandits, support one another so as to keep their thieves' cant intact. As Christ himself suggested, his house has become a den of thieves in many ways, a place for swindlers and merchants. Religious society has not improved at all. There is likely no need for me to provide further examples of this type of malpractice, as many, I am certain, have experienced similar circumstances to my own. But even a brief overview of comments online, given by these harbingers of duplicity, demonstrate my point well enough. Look for yourselves at the comments of the reformed. Their feet are quick to shed blood. The belittling, humiliation, and minimizing tactics of these Machiavellian sycophants are worthy of their predecessors, the Pharisees. Of course, these theologians will protest that such a label is unfair, mischaracterizing, and speaks more to my own misconduct than their own. How unloving of me. After all, they do not believe that salvation is by works as the Pharisees did. They unmask themselves with their own words, Christ's confrontations with the learned scholars of his time were not fundamentally with their soteriology, but instead with their inability to go beyond their own traditions. The Pharisees, like modern reformed theologians, reeked of artificial fabrication. Jesus answered them, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. They teach his doctrine the precepts of men. You have disregarded the commandment of God to keep the tradition of men. He went on to say, You neatly set aside the command of God to maintain your own tradition. Mark 7, 6-9 Are my words any harsher than the prophets, apostles, or Jesus himself? Or have the traditions of men so corrupted our senses that we have become fragile pacifists, a shell of what we were called to, who are now so fixed upon the tit of human sensitivity that we can no longer approach one another squarely? Where is the brother to whom I can sharpen myself with, as spoken of in Proverbs 27.17? Where is the friend who will wound me for my good, mentioned in Proverbs 27.6? Does not Paul call us to imitate Christ in 1 Corinthians 11.1? 1, the God-man, who was such a strong, salty irritant that it resulted in his own crucifixion. I hear his voice even now. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, 
which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. Matthew 23, 27. These same men too often are found quarreling with atheists and false teachers, giving the very word of God to these dogs and pigs, where the word is clear that to do so is foolish. Their lust for the accolades and recognitions of men who sit under their tutelage, whom they draw resources from in an act of sick predatory vampirism, is only outmatched by their attempt to self-delude themselves and those around them into their synthetic folklore and rituals as if it were the organic revelation of the Most High himself. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before swine. If you do, they may trample them under their feet, and then turn and tear you to pieces. Matthew 7, 6 How often we bore witness to the childish catchphrases of the reformed historicist. Phrases like dat armil or dat postmill are administered like a crude weapon upon the heads of those who thoughtfully and painstakingly rebut the very same miscalculations and blunders of these stiff-necked highbrows. They look down upon the so-called unlearned, untrained, and uneducated with contempt. Like dirt on their feet, we are beneath them and are dismissed as such, regardless of how potent our refutations may be. Is this not exactly the spirit that Christ himself warned would be present in the last days, when addressing his disciples through parables on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24 and 25? There, he warns, on numerous occasions, that the end of the age would be filled with unwise cowards who would be duped into seceding to the enemies of Jesus, in so far that they would beat their fellow servants, neglect to bring enough oil for the journey, and like goats, refuse to come to the aid of the Lord's little ones. Already we bear witness to the machinations of such behavior all around us, exhibited by the very ones who claim to be our allies. At the first sign of challenge or disagreement, the fangs of passive-aggressive gaslighting, isolation, and oratory beatings via the mindless repetition of colloquial slogans arising from the echo chamber that is reformed thinking, retract like blades, ready for the wounding of anyone who would dare defy their ascended theological expertise. These manipulators feign injury often in order to recruit the gullible into persecuting the truth-teller. Indeed, Paul's struggle is our own today, and his words explain a deep ignorance within the church. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? But why is all of this so? It is because, underlying all of their hubris, exists a fundamental terror. A true terror that all who stand upon the shifting sands of vain philosophy recognize within the recesses of their cognition. Scripture being the interconnected web as it is, contains within itself the remarkable principle of systemization. As Christ himself stated when confronting Satan, man must live off the whole word of God, not bread alone. And as the Apostle John stipulated, the word of God stems from the mind of the Logos, who is divine reason or rationality. As such, all of God's word is and must be perfectly harmonious. This being as it is, to change one's mind in one location often results in the need to readjust one's belief elsewhere so as to eliminate any and all logical contradictions. This is the reason why the reformed historicist lashes out with such an infantile display of indecency. To give an inch at the top of the system means to lose a mile within the deeper synthetic presuppositions of the theological arrangement. Like a crude Jenga tower, to move a piece at the top of the tower will often bring the entire tower's integrity into question. So it is the case here. The presuppositions, the very heart of this cultish sect, must be guarded at all costs. Parroted catchphrases are just one of the means by which these self-aggrandizing priests of disinformation float above the rest of us. Mottos like, God loves the sinner but hates the sin, are offered up like the jingle of an obnoxious infomercial that you wished would just stop. And yet, the clarity of scripture on this matter could not be more unmistakable. So it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Romans 9.13 
Moreover, you shall not follow the customs of the nations which I will drive out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I have hated them. Leviticus 20:23. 20, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. Psalm 5:5. 5, 5. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Psalm 11:5. All their evil is at Gilgal. Indeed, I have come to hate them there. Because of their wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. Hosea 9.15 Entire confessions are written to safeguard the fictitious imaginations of the anthropologically obsessed and their chronological snobbery. The old is right, and it cannot be anything other because only they affirm what they have decided is assumed as tolerable and satisfactory. All defiance against the fraudulent theological framework, and that is what it is, fraudulent, cannot be challenged intellectually, but instead must be squashed where it stands. To neglect such a response would ultimately result in the undoing of the current arrangement, which cannot be. And so, power structures of the ennoblement of the like-minded bring about the echo chambers needed to dull the discernment of the stupefied masses who enable their veiled aggression. It is the sensibilities of our age that garner the support of the majority to deny what is obvious. Would a god that loves everyone send some to hell? Only the pretentious musings of those who know better than the omniscient one would argue with his very word. No doubt, I, and anyone like me, will be quickly labelled as something akin to the Westboro Baptist Church, but such hasty dismissals only serve to demonstrate my point. Rather than inquiring further, discussing the matter, and attempting to seize the truth, where scripture affirms what stands in great contrast to the husk that is conservative theology today, the Reformed, who embody the spirit of the Pharisees and scribes, along with the liberals, I might add, will dismiss the claim on the face of it. After all, the system handed to them can never be examined through the lens of scripture. No, if anything, the scriptures are to be examined through the lens of artificial customs and practices, dreamed up by the egoist who trusts in himself, not God. Indeed, the formulation of a synthetic Christ that adheres to the fabricated sentiments of our culture is the bedrock of modern traditionalism. Their fragile egos cannot think outside of the rat cage they create for themselves and their acolytes. So then, what are we to do about all of this? The first thing is to recognize that we need not fall into despair. Christ, in his time, demonstrated the path that all truth-tellers are to take. The narrow road that stretches between the licentiousness of liberalism, the pietism of traditionalism, the irreligiosity of the non-believer, and the kingdom of darkness itself, each pressing down upon us, is a difficult road indeed. This journey is not for the faint-hearted, but for the faith-hearted. Faith, that very aspect of our lives, is governed and impressed upon us by a Father who loves us, and has ultimately good intentions for us, is the cure for hopelessness. Christ knew it, and we do too. We will conquer despite all of the odds. The truth will have its day in the sun. So we must be patient, and we must be far more attentive to God's word than those around us. It is imperative that we comprehend what true humility, as set down by eternal omniscience, is. It is not the limp-wristed reluctance to affirm something is certain. To be sure is not prideful. To be certain is not a sin. In fact, the great physician Luke, as carried along by the Spirit, assures us that certainty is the inheritance of the one who puts his trust in the Lord. Therefore, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Luke 1, 3-4 True humility, therefore, is not the self-aggrandizing attempt to refer to oneself as free of certitude. It is instead a recognition of one's inability to know better than God himself. 
Humility is to logically submit to the revelation of the omniscient Holy One. It is to recognize and acknowledge that I am wrong when another logically demonstrates that what I believe cannot be so because it is written. As wisdom herself attests to, the wise bind the word of the Lord around their neck. They write them on the tablet of their heart. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments, for they will add length to your days, years and peace to your life. Never let loving devotion or faithfulness leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favor and high regard in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This will bring healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Proverbs 3, 1 to 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8-9 Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you with speculation about what he has seen. Such a person is puffed up without basis by his unspiritual mind. He has lost connection to the head, from whom the whole body, supported and knit together by its joints and ligaments, grows as God causes it to grow. Colossians 2, 18-19 To remain humble is to stay fixed upon God's word, despite the traditions of men. It is the rejection of all things synthetic for what is spiritual. Secondly, we must shift our time and attention away from those who do not deserve it. Christ warned, as mentioned earlier, of wolves and pigs to whom we may throw holy meat and pearls. To give our time, energy, and resources to those who would only scorn it with disregard in statements such as dat armil or other inane and mindless comments is foolish. Instead, we must use our resources wisely and apply it to people who are humble enough to look beyond the traditions that stand in contrast to scripture. Arguing, reasoning, and attempting to convert the minds of those partial to creeds, confessions, and catchphrases that remain within the realm of what is palatable to prideful appetites is a waste of our limited reserves. Give these things instead to those who can truly accept and benefit from you. Do not rebuke mockers, or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise, and they will love you. Instruct the wise, and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous, and they will add to their learning. Proverbs 9, 8-9 Mockers resent correction, so they avoid the wise. Proverbs 15, 12 Thirdly, we must leave an inheritance for our children. That is, as men, we must pass on what has been delivered to us to our spiritual children. A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Proverbs 13, 22. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. 2 Timothy 2, 2. We must warn, instruct, and teach what is true to other wise men, and they, in turn, must do the same. There are many ways to do this, too writing books, creating media, speaking to others, being involved within discussions, and more. All of these methods are helpful ways to deliver what has been given to us. And finally, we must support one another. Fending off the wolves, dealing with the world, taking on Satan, combating sin, reminding one another of our ideals, encouraging each other to move towards these ideals, and challenging one another when we see another slipping. All of this can be accomplished when brothers of sound mind stick together. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. 
Ecclesiastes 4.12. For by wise guidance, you can wage your war, and in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Proverbs 24.6. For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but with many counselors comes deliverance. Proverbs 11.14. The current state of the conservative church is a dismal one. Of that, there is no doubt. But if we are ever going to turn this ship around, it will not be done by one man. A brotherhood of believers is necessary for this task. And by brotherhood, I do not mean what is commonly understood today as Christian companionship, where weak men sit together stroking one another's egos with flattery, something that only serves to protect the fragility of these unsteady and anemic souls. Instead, what I refer to is the same mindset that David had, an ethos in which we embrace one another's challenges and do not shy away from intellectual sparring, even when it gets heated. Nor does the man feign weakness and injury in order to attract the sympathies of the overprotective molly coddlers, who only serve to weaken the men in their midst. What we need is to rally around Paul's ideal for true inner strength and stoicism. What we require is the unwavering and unrelenting determination to uphold those who instill true biblical values within themselves and inspire other men towards excellence as guided by wisdom. Let a righteous man strike me, that is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, that is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it, for my prayer will be against the deeds of the evildoers. Psalm 141, 5. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. 1 Corinthians 16, 13.